So far, we've done threat, then we did needs, warfighter needs. So now we know what we need. Now we've got to find the technologies and the things that may fit that, that gap. And so this, uh, this panel here the mo will be the modernizing the future force science and technology panel. Uh, it's moderated by uh, Colonel Ronald Pfizer, U.S. Army retired, who's a fellow at LMI. And most of you would recognize him if he wears a uniform since he's just a recently retired guy from the Pentagon, uh, right hand man for Chris Hassel. So without any further ado, it's all yours, Mark. So thank you, Mandy. Thank you, NDIA, for uh, putting the conference together and uh, structuring it in this order. Um, as you mentioned, we're going to focus this hour session on the role of science and technology and what it does uh, to enable modernizing the future force. For today's panel, we have two objectives. One is each of the uh, panel members is going to provide a, uh, a brief update on the role of their organization and how it is contributing to enabling modernization of the future force whether that's through science and technology or the enabling factors that come in to make sure that science and technology is properly focused on those uh, needs of the future force. The second goal is to provide an opportunity through the dialogue and your questions for them to expand on their role and also uh, answer questions on what they feel are the needs of the S&T community to help address those CDRN threats and hazards. I'm going to briefly uh, read through each of their uh, uh, bios, and then at that point I'll turn it over to each of the individuals to present and uh, uh, sequence their presentations. So first with us we have Rear Admiral Colin Chin. He's the Joint Staff Surgeon at the Pentagon. He serves as the Chief Medical Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, providing advice to the Chairman, the Joint Staffs, the Combatant Commanders, and, and <coughs> excuse me, he also is coordinating all issues related to health services, including operational medicine, force health protection, and readiness among the combatant commanders, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and the services. He's earned his uh, doctor of medicine and has accomplished his career as a doctor and leader within the U.S. Navy. makes him a vital asset as he helps strive to make sure that our military health system delivers integrated system of readiness. Our next panel member, Dr. Ron Hand, is the director of the Chemical and Biological Technologies Department within the Defense Threat Reduction Agency located on Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Dr. Han oversees a vibrant science and technology department that works with industry, research universities, and other agencies within the U.S. government to research, develop, and field revolutionary technologies that address the threats posed by chemical and biological weapons, materials, agents, and emergency emerging diseases to our warfighters. He's a member of the Senior Executive Service and a former Army officer. Also on our panel today is Dr. Eric Moore. He's the director of the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command Chemical and Biological Center, the primary Department of Defense technical organization for non-medical chemical and biological defense. He's an expert in chemical and biological defense programs and medical countermeasures. He's also a member of the Senior Executive Service and as well a former Army officer. And then lastly on our panel is Dr. Julio Barrera Oro. He's a health scientist with the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority within the Agency for the Assist Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He serves as a project officer managing the development of medical countermeasures against civilian CDRN threats. Prior to BARDA, he served as a CDRN policy analyst within ASPR and an emergency coordinator within the FDA and as a program coordinator with SI. So at this point, without wasting any more time, I'd like to turn it over to Admiral Chin. Admiral Chin.
Thank you, Ron, for the introduction. I also want to thank the NDIA and Mr. Bryce for providing me the opportunity to uh, serve on this panel. It's been really a privilege for me to be here. So for the uh, short period of time that I'll do my introductory comments, I'm going to focus on identifying the threat environment as viewed from the Joyce staff. I think that will complement what you heard from the first session. We'll also talk about sort of future war fighting trends, again, from the, from the Joint Force perspective, talk about a new concept for the chairman, which is global integration, and then my role uh, in, in, in that construct. So here's the current uh, threat environment. 38 years ago, when I first raised my right hand in 1981, this was not the map. Uh, as you all recall, that was uh, 1981, so the beginning of the, uh, the Reagan administration. We were in the, in the midst of the Cold War. There was one threat. It was the Soviet Union back uh, and, you know, on one side with the Warsaw Pact and the United States and the uh, Western democracies on the other side. So a bipolar world. Fast forward you know, 38 years, here's what we have. You heard about the five uh, main potential adversaries that we have, and the, and the uh, NDS has identified two um, peer or near-peer competitors. A resurgent Russia under President Putin, who is trying to reestablish the Russian military as a global force. And you have an emerging China under President Xi, who also has aspirations to make the uh, People's Liberation Army a, a global military force. But they're also challenging the United States in other domains, in the, uh, the uh, economic realm, diplomatic realm, uh, cultural realm. And of course you have uh, Iran, uh, doesn't necessarily maybe have global aspirations, but they want to be the global or the regional leader in the Middle East. And then uh, North Korea under KJU, you know, they do have a nuclear capability, but as we all know, they are trying to develop a, cap a capability to deliver that nuclear capability. And of course we're all familiar with the threat of violent extremist organizations, again, that is a global and worldwide threat. What the map is also supposed to point out is that these threats are global in nature. So if, you're, if you are the Indo-PACOM commander, yes, you have to worry about um, you know, North Korea and China, but so does the, all the other combatant commanders because of these global threats. UCOM has to be concerned about what's going on uh, in, in China and North Korea. Uh, likewise, the other uh, combat commanders. So we have multi-region threats out there, and then multi-domain threats, as you heard earlier uh, this morning. So not just the traditional air, land, and sea threats, but we have the cyber threat, which is the background behind you know, the standing up of from a, a sub-unified command, U.S. cyber command, now a full combatant command, and of course, current administration has looked at the space domain. See that as a potential area that we need to be concerned about, so the process is on the way to um, establish a space command. So the purpose of this slide is to, for me to point out to you that, you know, past 20 years, you know, we have been focused on counterinsurgency operations. If we were to have a conflict with a peer or near-peer competitor, it's not going to be coin. It's going to be going back to traditional type of warfare, with a modern twist, obviously. Also, we've been sort of very lucky in the last 20, 30 years to be to uh, operate in uncontested environments. The f potential future environment may be denied to us, both the air, land, and sea. And if you're a Navy officer, Air Force officer, or any of the aviation branches, when did you think about, if you're in the Navy, that you would not have free access to the sea or free access to the air. That may change. There's no guarantees in the future constructs. Also points out that, um, again, we've been the last 20 to 15 years, we've been fixed, we've been operating from fixed, fixed bases on land. Um, if, again, you know, peer, near peer competitor, it's going to be back to maneuver warfare. The Navy and the Marine Corps are going back to their traditional roots, or, um, roots of amphibious warfare and expeditionary warfare. Also, we fight now as a joint force, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force. And we also work with our coalition partners. Again, that's the importance of allies and partners as the second pillar. 
in a national defense strategy. With that then, among the services, among our coalition partners, we have to think about interoperability and standardization. And the final point I want to make on this slide is the CBR divide. There is now that potential, which in the last 15 years really didn't, we weren't really having to concern ourselves about that. Now this is front and center of everyone's attention. So everyone here in this audience, I know you're working very hard to develop some solutions if we have to go and, and reach potential future scenarios. Very quickly, this is just a, um, the, the org chart for the DOD. The reason I show this is really um, the box at the lower right hand corner. That's the 10 combatant commands, the six geographical combatant commands, the four functional commands. And it's because I show this because the entire department really should be focusing on support to the warfighter, which is those combatant commands. And so with that, this is where the chairman of global integration comes. So I just showed you that first slide in the threat map in which it's multi-region and multi-domain. So from an individual combatant commander command uh, perspective, they don't have enough resources. They don't have people, uh, material, equipment, if they were to have to execute one of their plans. And we're, we're, you know, we have been in a restrained uh, environment in that regard. You know, we're back when I, when I signed up, over two, two and a half million active duty, active component folks. We're now down to 1.2. You know, we have fewer Army divisions, fewer, fewer Navy ships and Air Force uh, squadrons out there, and every combatant commander wants them. So there has to be an individual looking at the global threats that face our nation, has to look at those threats, identify the risks, and then prioritize those risks and provide recommendations to the President and the Secretary of Defense. And that individual is the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Because you heard this morning about O plans, we still have O plans and CON plans, but there's now a new concept because of global integration, we have globally integrated base plans. Because if we were to have to execute one of those plans, it's gonna be all the COCOMs will have will be involved either in primary role or in a supporting role. And finally, where is the Joint Staff Surgeon outfit in this? Since the, uh, the chairman is the global integrator, naturally the Joint Staff Surgeon is the global medical integrator for the military health system. This is not a C2 relationship, it's a coordination relationship. Because you just, just heard, uh, the Joint Staff Surgeon has a relationship with the COCOMs, there is a relationship with the Defense Health Agency, a relationship with the Service Surgeon Generals, and a relationship with ASD Health Affairs. And so my role is seeing these big threats from a medical readiness perspective is to help coordinate collectively our efforts to make sure that the Joint Force and Joint Medical Force is ready if there's a future conflict. Thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. So thank you, sir. At this point, Dr. Han will follow up, but the reason that we led with that is because it's very important, as we heard in the earlier morning sessions, that there is no stovepipe solution here. It has to be integrated. That's the theme of that first presentation. It has to be tied to the requirements to execute the operations and uh, win in that complex environment. So now we'll transition to some of the folks that do work in the S&T space. All right, good afternoon. So I think it's great I get to actually talk to you. Um, last year I got to talk to you right after lunch. You may remember I walked down among the crowd, right? Those of you who were there. So I think they put me in a chair this year so I wouldn't traumatize you. Uh, I was looking for the seatbelt, but I didn't see seatbelt. But anyway, I'll try not to be, I keep my energy level up for you. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about what we do. I think many of you have heard about Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Uh, so I'll just reinforce uh, some of the key tenets of what we do and then uh, go from there. So we go to the next slide. Where's there? Oh, sorry. Got it. All right, so um, we got a new director about two years ago, Bill Oxford, and Ditcher has really done a hard uh, assessment of itself and what Ditcher does and what is the mission of Ditcher as a combat support agency. And over the evolution of this discussion about 
um, what our requirements are and how we do this. We've really come to uh, believe that there's a much more operational focus that we can provide back to the combat commands. So what you're really starting to hear come out of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and those of you who are working with this have heard this before, we're really going to go out and, and detect and defeat uh, threat networks. We're going left of boom. That's what we're, we're chasing. So you can now see that we have a new mission statement that uh, DITRA is really about going out and enabling our international partners and U.S. government partners to go after networks um, to get things left the boom so that they don't become something that we have to respond to. Because once you have to respond, um, that becomes expensive both in lives as well as material costs to recover. So uh, we're going left the boom. That's what Fisher's mission is all about. So you'll see this going on. We're going through another reorg today. I know it's for the day we organize again. Um, yes, we are. This is the third one in six years. Um, and we're now um, totally integrating Jido into the organization, and you're going to see um, some changes within the digital organization over the next year that I think really streamline and make more efficient the processes that we do to support the combat command. So look forward to seeing that. Um, within my department, not only do I support the combat support role with, through my Ditcher hat, but I also am the Joint Science and Technology Office Director for the Kim Bao Defense Program. So I actually wear the two hats. Um, so I get oversight from Kim Bao Defense Program and I get uh, material support through DITRA. Um, our mission still remains to uh, lead DOD science technology. We go out there and find game-changing technologies to change how we fight, to make it more likely, to, you know, so our, our warfighters, when they come into a seabird environment, not only do they survive, but they continue to fight and win the battles for our nation. That's what it's all about. So my job is to go out there and be the, the cavalry scout for technology, bring it in, adapt it to the military needs, uh, and get it out to the, the warfighters so that they can do what they need to do. Um, I really have three pillars. This hasn't changed over time. And you're starting to hear uh, these things as, from my, my partners out there, uh, this integration concept that you know, I can no longer afford to have separate boxes that say Kimbao Defense. We need to be looking at what the warfighter already has. We need to integrate our capabilities into those components so that the thing they use every day is the thing they need when this Kimbao event occurs. So my first tenant has always been integrated early warning. We always talk about the fog of war, that operation commanders out there have a hard time understanding what's going on. And as soon as you put that, that protective mask on, it gets that much worse. So how, what are the tools and how can we help the commanders out there have more time to respond to these, these crises when camp events occur on the battlefield? It's not just sensors. It's not just warning and reporting. It's the fusion of all of this stuff from satellites to foxhole, we have to have tools that actually help our commanders understand what's going on and provide decisions in a timely manner to support the warfighter on the battlefield. So integrated early warning, very broad spectrum approach to looking at that. Integrated layer defense, you heard that from Doug Rice this morning. Again, it's not just that one box that solves the problems that we have. We really have to integrate a variety of technologies and capabilities, and it's not just material solutions. Sometimes it's doctrine, sometimes it's training, sometimes it's having the right team assembled to do the mission that's got to be done. So that integrated layer defense is all about integration capabilities across multiple technologies and capabilities and training and teams to accomplish the mission for the warfighter. And then my last tenet really is about prepare for surprise. And Doug touched on this this morning as well. Um, we will be surprised. Don't, don't think that we won't. People are out there watching how we fight. They've seen us fight coin for the last 15 years. They know what we do. So they're looking for the chinks in our armor, and we can expect to see that. So as Doug indicated earlier this morning, going after one bug, one drug solutions is not gonna do it. We actually have to have broad capabilities, resilient response capabilities to go after things on a, on a, on a much more agile basis. So this is why you see me trying to put capabilities into our advanced development manufacturing facilities. One of the things I think is really cool is a DNA vaccine that we're looking at. If I can do a DNA vaccine, and I could do a DNA vaccine anywhere in the world because I'm just taking ATCs and GDs and I'm putting them together and I'm creating a vaccine. So couldn't I do that in an ambulance somewhere forward rather than having to have a cold chain all the way in the States and get it two, 3,000 miles away. So looking at those kind of things, how do I have resilient capabilities that are prepared to respond on very short notice? So it really kind of is the tenets of our program within uh, the district JSTOP office. 
Um, most of you probably know this. I put the slide in for those of you who are new and never seen this before. Um, this is how you can get in contact with us. This is how we do business contracting. Um, there has been a large move in the, in the past couple of years to move towards other transactional authority type contracts. So if you're in the, one of the OTA teams, congratulations, that's a good, good move. Uh, but we still do broad agency announcements. We still do grants. All those things are still available. Um, so I just want to make sure that you knew how to get in contact with us if you needed to. And uh, I'm always open too. I think most of you know if you want to do a one-on-one, -on -one, even with me, I will do that and I'll try and have the right team there to sit down with you and talk about how we potentially can do business together and I'll help further elaborate what our needs are to support the work harder. Um, and I'll just put a plug in from a shameless plug. Uh, our conference is coming up in Cincinnati, 18 to uh, 21 November, so we'd love to see you come out and participate. I know many of you will be there, so I look forward to seeing you at that as well. And that is it for me. Um, I look forward to your questions. So thank you. Next we'll transition to Dr. Moore and he'll tell us a little bit about his new role as the uh, director of the uh, uh, Combat Capabilities Development Command Chemical and Biological Science. So that's a mouthful from, you know us formerly as the Edgewood Chemical Biological Center, now the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command. So one of the things I wanted to highlight today is just a few of the changes which are, are assets, I think, for us within Team Severnia. So this just highlights the fact that we're now part of Army Futures Command. I think when I was here last year, we were part of Army Material Command under General Gus Perna down to the uh, RDECOM, now um, Combat Capabilities Development Command. Um, you may see that as DEFCOM, but that's actually two C's over the DEFCOM, so. And then beyond that, um, of course, all the centers are there as well, um, of which you see us highlighted in yellow. One of the changes is that SLAD and the ARL and what was formerly known as AMSA are the Data and, uh, uh, Analytics Center now or data and analysis center. In addition to that, the foundational laboratory is still Army Research Laboratory. This just kind of highlights a few leadership changes that we've had. Um, as a matter of fact, I think it was yesterday we had um, our SES pending ceremony for our newest uh, SES, our Director of Research and Technology, Dr. Rick Cox. Uh, Dr. S I mean, uh, Ms. Suzanne Milkling is the uh, Engineering Director, and of course, uh, Dr. Paul Tannenbaum, formerly of the Director of Program Integration, now known as the Operational Analysis Director. Part of the reason for doing that was to align the, uh, the testing mission under the Biotesting Division that's reports to Paul uh, to ensure that we have uh, testing uh, uh, independence, as well as the CBAR chemical email mission that still goes on. And of course, we also still have Dr. Wade Fountain for another day or two because he retires on the 26th, but he's our, our senior scientist, ST for chemistry, we also have um, Dr. Emanuel for biotechnology, the same scientist. So I'd be remiss last year, I forgot to get the video working, and Ron had his working, so this year I'm going to have my video playing. Oh, oh I think I am. Right, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm good. The U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command, Chemical Biological Center, has been an international leader in the CV defense community. From developing some of the earliest gas masks in World War I to destroying chemical weapons stockpiles, the center has evolved in its mission to protect the U.S. and Allied warfighters from chemical and biological threats. The threats we face are ever-changing, from continuing to deal with World War I-era chemical weapons to non-state actors to threats outside the battlefield, we continue to face and overcome new challenges. Employing hundreds of the world's brightest chemists, biologists, and engineers, the center is well equipped to handle any challenge facing our warfighters and our nation. Our scientists are on the forefront of CV defense. In the field, we're destroying stockpiles of chemical warfare agent at home and providing chemical warfare material destruction solutions to the international community. In the lab, we're looking for the newest breakthroughs and building on the newest tools for the warfighter. In partnership with academia, industry, federal agencies, and allied nations, we serve not just the Army, but the Joint Military Force, 
protecting warfighters around the globe, on land, in the air, and at sea. Through these partnerships, we will improve our detection capabilities, updating traditional technologies like the JCAD, and fielding new ones like the Min-Ion and Paper Spray. Our future holds untold advances, self-decontaminating uniforms, augmented reality in the field, and solutions that harness the natural abilities of living systems through synthetic biology. New advances will improve protection as we develop fibers that destroy chemical agent on contact, and we'll create new technologies that decontaminate chemical agent so the warfighter can complete their mission unhindered by contaminated equipment. Our vision is a world free from chemical and biological threats. For a century, we've delivered world-class solutions to these challenges, and will continue to do so for the next 100 years. So again, you've probably seen this before, but just to highlight some collaboration opportunities in terms of technology transfer, and beyond that, some of the mechanisms that we use, obviously cradles, uh, educational partnership agreements, and others as well. So we have a team here uh, that actually work in that space, so if you go to the booth, you'll actually have some of the primary points of contact. And again, for doing business with us. Just to kind of highlight and, and, and recap, I really wanted to highlight couple of things other than just the name change, but as part of the Future Force Modernization uh, Enterprise within the Army now, we actually report uh, under AFC, we have the annual mission guidance, we do a number of updates, and I think there's a lot of synergies that we can leverage between working with some of the other technology areas as we focus on some of the cross-functional teams. Uh, mostly we've been integrated through partnering with uh, JPEO and, and DITRA, JSTO, uh, through the uh, Next Generation Combat Vehicle. Also, our Army funding line that goes in for obscuration, for breaching missions, et cetera, is also plugged into that. So all of these uh, have direct integration and, and, and synergies that we wanted to leverage and highlight here. So with that, um, I look forward to the questions, and thank you. And to round out the uh, presentations, Dr. Barrera Oro, who uh, give us a little bit of insight in what uh, HHS as an interagency partner is doing in this space. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for the invite and for the opportunity to speak on behalf of uh, BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. Uh, a little bit of a departure from, um, obviously, the DOD-themed conference, but hopefully I will speak to the synergies and the, and the, the correlations and the compare and contrast our mission with the DOD's, which you'll find overlaps a little bit more than maybe previously appreciated. So, again, BARDA is an office within the uh, ASPR, which is the agency level. Entity, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. This is an agency within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Now, the mission of ASPR is quite simply to save lives and protect Americans from 21st century civilian health security threats. Um, essentially, how they do that is by providing strong leadership, supporting the regional disaster health response systems, uh, increasing the health, public health security capacity, and lastly, to uh, develop a medical countermeasure and enterprise for which BARDA is in charge. Uh, these uh, CBRN threats span the range of material threat determination, uh, established uh, plausible high consequence health scenarios as determined by the Department of Homeland Security. And also, more recently, we're moving into the unknown threat uh, space and preparedness through medical countermeasure initiatives there, which I'll get into in a little bit. So the BARDA model, essentially it is to make available, to develop and make available medical countermeasures or MCMs by forming unique private uh, and public partnerships to drive, generation, to drive innovation from the bench to the patient. And we do this by funding the development of medical countermeasures uh, by contracting uh, uh, entities uh, such as companies to develop them. We have flexible and nimble authorities, multi-year funding. We also support our contractors with in-house product development expertise that range the disciplines of product development, regulatory, non-clinical, clinical, clinical um, and manufacturing. Uh, we promote innovation and we also facilitate partnerships that we enjoy across government to try to establish common uh, overlapping goals and mission preparedness uh, objectives. Some of these government partners that I'll highlight here, obviously the CDC for public health uh, preparedness uh, efforts, 
the NIH, which drives a lot of our more early pipeline and development for MCMs, and <clears throat> some of which transition to BARDA for advanced development. And the FDA to try to educate them on how we anticipate these medical countermeasures will be used in the health threats and areas that we're preparing for. And all the entities of DOD that have to do with medical countermeasure development, DARPA, DITRA, and so forth. <coughs> now, since being established in December 2000, Six, we've established 250, actually more than 250 partnerships with uh, industry that span the range from small biotech to big pharma, uh, US and ex-US. Essentially, the point of the slide is only to say that if you have a great product that can meet our uh, preparedness objectives, we will work with you to bring it to fruition. Uh, a bit of our success in the past 12 years, this is actually an outdated slide now, uh, it's actually 48 FDA approvals, licensures, and clearances through our contracts, three uh, developed just last week. These span small molecule drug development, uh, biologics, and devices and diagnostics. We also uh, fund initial procurement of the products that we contract to FDA approval through our Project BioShield program. We've supported 27 such products to date, 15 of which have reached initial procurement into the strategic national stockpile, and 10 of which have already gained FDA approval, licensure, or clearance. It is the goal of procurement and FDA approval, licensure, or clearance for all 27 and future Project BioShield products. What I want to iterate from this slide is, as you heard this entire conference, it's an increasingly complex and dangerous world. And more and more, we're not just focusing on the one bug, one drug solutions for all the threats that we know about, but more efforts to address the unknowns. Now the unknowns, again, you keep hearing the word capabilities, capabilities, capabilities. It's an approach that BART is also starting to take. We're looking at platform technologies to try to spur the uh, manufacture of uh, diagnostics and, and treatments earlier uh, to detection, uh, in vivo and ex vivo uh, MCM expression systems, as well as more agnostic treatments that can bo boost human immunity or provide more broad range coverage against multiple threats. Some of our uh, main priority investment areas in our division are to develop rapid response capabilities to address unknown threats, as I just stated, to repurpose products already approved to treat injuries for brand new and chemical threats, to invest in new antibacterial agents, and to develop, to deliver countermeasures under development for chem and viral hemorrhagic fever threats. We also have supported earlier pipeline development, especially uh, in the two programs that I'll uh, touch upon briefly here. In 2015, we established CARVEX, which is a Competing Antibiotic Resistance Bacteria Initiative. Essentially, this is a partnership with global funding agencies such as the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust to drive the earlier pipeline development of antibacterials against uh, multi-drug resistance. We have 60 such products so far uh, supported this way. In 2018, closely following the DARPA model, we developed DRIVE, which is the Division of Research, Innovation, and Ventures. Again, this is a more broad-based uh, initiative to transform health security by doing things such as trying to solve sepsis, which is a ubiquitous second-order health threat that would result from many of the health security uh, scenarios that we're preparing for, as well as try to provide wearable diagnostics to the end user so that they can empower their decisions and their faster response when they're infected with a threat agent. Now, in quick summary, uh, over our 12 years or so of existence, we've partnered with 250 industry partners, had 45 uh, Approvals over 42 different medical countermeasures, supported 27 different products under BioShield for procurement. We've also uh, tenfolded the domestic vaccine production against influenza by supporting initiatives for advanced uh, contract manufacturing. And we've uh, populated the antibacterial development pipeline through CARB-X. Now, I realize a lot of that is a blur and it's, and it's a bit of a departure from what we've been talking about, but to find out more information, your one-stop shop is medicalcountermeasures.gov where you can find our current solicitation or broad agency announcement that highlights all the requirements for the products we're looking for that span the uh, range of CDR and threats that we are preparing for. And you can also, if you're an interested company, apply for TechWatch, which will allow you to come in and talk to uh, us about your technology, how it may align to that broad agency announcement, and get feedback from our uh, cadre of in-house development experts. 
as well as a shameless plug for our Bard Industry Day uh, on October 15th and 16th, where you can come and hear about all our programs in depth and also have Tech Watch face-to-face -face meetings there as well. So thank you all for the invitation, and I look forward to the discussion. So thank you. I trust that everybody either had a reconfirmation of what they believe they knew about each of the individual's organization's role in this space or learned something new. So at this point, I'd like to begin to transition to the questions, and clearly people are paying attention because our question board is already populated with at least four, and I think there's a few more in the background. So starting with the first one, and uh, this will uh, go to Dr. Han, um, how did GISTO investments end up in JPO programs, and how early does transition planning begin? So that, that is a great question. Um, a lot of it is uh, direct coordination with the uh, program managers, with the science technology managers that I have. So very early in the process. Um, I guess it starts with where does the requirement come from? It comes from the COCOM and the combat commanders and the services saying I have a gap. They go to JPO first to see if JPO can do something using commercial off-the-shelf technologies. There's something already there. If it's not there, then we communicate what are those S&T gaps, and from that we'll develop S&T programs that support development and capability. Um, so that really is the kind of the cycle that drives the train on one side. On the other side is the disruptive technologies, the new technologies that people aren't thinking about. Um, about 30% of my portfolio is looking for game-changing things that you know, you couldn't predict, right? So, if, you know, if we had had requirements, I guess, back in the 1910s, we had wanted a faster force instead of thinking about tanks. So my team is out there thinking about how do I get to the next kind of technology that changes how we fight. Um, there's a lot of ways that, that we uh, coordinate these in terms of getting it into a program or record. Often what you'll find is an s and program that will develop what it, what's on the technology horizon. Um, we don't always think about what's most affordable. We often ask the question, can I do it? And if I can do it, then, then we start looking for, can I bring the cost price down on some of these things. Um, but from that point on, it uh, really starts translating into what will become the um, critical, critical uh, requirements for a program that actually end up getting written into a requirement that creates a program record that then starts at the JPO. So it really starts the process very early on where we're talking to the warfighter, identifying the gaps, providing technology solutions, bringing the program managers into the discussion, and seeing if we're actually getting what the work part needs. One of the things uniquely um, nice about the other transaction authority contracts that we do that I'd like to just kind of iterate to you if you haven't caught on to it already, it actually helps eliminate the valley of death that we traditionally have between s and and advanced developer. So we're able actually to do, as we go through the negotiation process, both the science technology manager and the program managers can sit down with the industry partner that we're looking to work with develop what we're going to require it's going to be, and both of us can simultaneously put funding on a contract. So I can put BA2, BA3, and JPO can put BA4, if you understand all the colors of money, onto one of these types of contracts, which then really means that uh, JPO can go almost to the direct production office, something like that. So recognize, though, that in an OTA contract, you've got to produce a prototype as an end product. It's not just a study. We're looking for an actual material thing to come out of that. But that gives us a lot broader um, ability when we actually do some of the questions. So that's some of the ways that we go through um, putting stuff into JPO programs. Some of it's pull, coming from the program manager saying this is my gaps, and some of it's push, where I'm trying to give new kinds of technologies that we hadn't thought about before. Thank you, Dr. Han. I'm going to move to the second question, and I'm going to ask Dr. Moore to initially take this, and I'll turn to the other panel members since they may be some input from them. So how well is the CWMB, I'm sorry, it's, it just jumped. Um, so, yeah, so how, how do you all work with the JPO to move? Like, we just answered that question, I'm sorry. Uh, let's go to the uh, question I'll ask Dr. Barrera War to answer the number two. How well is the CWMB, Suburban s and integrated and synchronized in terms of effort and resources across all the 19 U.S. federal agencies that have a U.S. code for the CWMB mission? Because I know you play a role <laughs> in that, and then I'll turn to the other panel members. So I can speak to my previous life as a uh, CBR and uh, ASPR policy analyst. We had a uh, entity called the FEMC, the Public Health Emerg the Public Emergency Medical Countermeasures Enterprise, in which our requirements were tried to codify across all the agencies that would have a, a stakeholder engagement in this, and obviously the warfighter was one of them, as well as the civilian. So essentially it started from integrated uh, product teams depending on the threat of you know, the health 
scenario that DHS was telling us to prepare for, the medical consequences thereof, and then developing the types of products, the product specific requirements, the left right boundaries for these, these products, to get a kind of common understanding of what would be the you know, threshold or, or ideal product characteristic of such a thing. And that would go all the way up the, the chain, all the way to the agency level, and then uh, JPEO, and then uh, all the mission leadership of uh, the various entities of DOD had a seat at that table. So. That's one, and number two, a lot of our um, portfolios kind of cross, cross pollinate, and we try to even fund the same products for different indications, so that we're not doing duplicative effort and we get more value proposition. If you're, for instance, in my uh, field of thermal burn, if we're funding a treatment for partial thickness burns, DOD might be funding the uh, full thickness burn indication, so that we can make the best product for both our realm civilian and warfighter. Thank you. Um... Hey, Dr. Hand. So I would say that, you know, in terms of how well we're integrated, um, I think the community is integrated pretty well. I think we're struggling a little bit with the Department of Homeland Security right now, but across the other agencies, I think we have very good interaction going on. Um, our partner from BARDA indicated 45 successes. Believe it or not, 17 of those had roots in the Department of Defense translated over into BARDA and became programs that go into the stockpile. So I think that kind of interaction is just critical to the success of the program, I just point that out. Um, recently, we've been doing open air tests of fentanyl to see what the operational effects of those would be so that we provide better protective measures for our troops. Um, and we had Drug Enforcement Agency, Environmental Protection Agency, international partners, uh, as well as you know, HHS, a, a large number of folks actually out participating and looking at these trials to understand the effects of what fentanyl is going to do so when used them against us uh, on the battlefield. So I think. Uh, in general, we have a pretty strong, pretty strong uh, integration. The National Biofence Strategy that came out uh, last year further kind of refines the roles and responsibility of folks as we look at these uh, kind of things across the enterprise. Uh, you know, my contribution, <coughs> so <coughs> part of becoming a joint staff surgeon, I was the uh, director J9 at the Defense Health Agency, and I was responsible for medical R&D um, within the military health system. And I was at $2 billion um, Defense Health Program, RDT and e uh, budget. Um, what I learned from that was that um, through the JPCs centered at MRMC up at Fort Detrick, uh, we were coordinating a lot of those, those efforts, with the exception in this space, because that was not part of my portfolio. I learned that the PEO was responsible for that. But with that, uh, we, we coordinated, we made sure we coordinated with them those efforts that we were doing in our space to make sure it was in parallel and not conflicted with them. Now as the Joint Staff Surgeon, you saw my slide as that coordination integrator person, I continued that work, getting the input from the command, command surgeons of what are the gaps and seams that they're seeing in this space, bringing it back again to DC and coordinating with my uh, partners in the interagency to make sure we're all working together towards the same, uh, same goals. Thank you. Dr. Moore. So as well, if you look at the Chem Bio Defense Program in general, so a center like uh, Chem Bio Center, which is about 86% cost reimbursable, mostly funded thank you for your service, from Dr. Han on the ST side, and from uh, uh, Mr. Bryce from uh, JPO. But that accounts for only about 55% of the funding, so there's a, a huge amount of money that's within our core competencies from the FBI, uh, the DEA, TSA, uh, State Department, uh, Commerce Department, et cetera, that actually we can leverage with part of the, uh, the Kimball Defense broader mission. So a lot of that will hit some of the uh, first responder uh, uh, requirements will also be for things that um, actually even the civilian population would use. So we're able to leverage that um, across the board for not only the Kimball Defense Program, but just, you know, Severity defense throughout the nation. Okay, thank you. So clearly standoff is a uh, priority for this audience. So uh, the question of standoff is an important aspect of the future, but currently there are no programs focused on it. Is there any funding planned for the standoff area? So Dr. Hamill, we'll start with you. So, so this is great because it's got kind of gets at a philosophical discussion about what do you mean by standoff? All right, you know, I think traditionally when people think standoff, it's the idea of beaming a laser out getting some information back off of that, it tells you something's there and what it is. 
Um, but what does the warfighter really want? The warfighter wants to know that something is out there so that he doesn't walk into it, right? So what we're really talking about is situational understanding of the battlefield. So we talked about integrated early warning. So standoff is actually a component of integrated early warning. It's, it's buried in there. I actually don't use the term standoff because that tends to apply to a specific technology. I beam a laser out and get information back. What we really want is the ability to know that something is out there to have early warning to not wander into it. So what you're seeing in the new NBC reconnaissance vehicle redesign of the, of the equipment sensor system, sensor suite, is the idea that I shouldn't have to drive a vehicle across a road to determine if something's dirty because now the, the, the vehicle itself is dirty. Can I have other technologies actually will go out there and find that for me? So the idea of using quadcopters that are relatively cheap to be able to go out and sense an area, provide back information, that that little whatever the cost is, quadcopter is compromised and we don't want to bring it back. Well, that's a lot cheaper thing than trying to reconstitute an entire striker NBC RS or some other, other new variant that we're creating. So it's really about giving the commander time and decision space um, and also to have the opportunity to know something's coming your way. So I think laser, I think the idea of standoff of having things that beam out energy and give you information back works if you use it the way it works best. I mean, LiDAR and IR, there's a variety of technologies that will tell you there's a cloud out there. Well, that's actually essential information, of course, to know there's a cloud out there. It's not just an HU and a high explosive round to hit the ground, but there's actually a cloud coming off of that round. So that's an essential part of early warning for a commander. So we have systems that can watch. So I'm going to talk about integrated early warning and standoff again as a component of that. We go from satellites that are watching special units set up. You know, we can see from a distance that some special unit's about to do something. That's our first cue. We've got things that can watch rounds in the air. If they wobble, maybe it's a chem round. It's not necessarily an HE round. When it hits the ground, you know, we've got acoustics that will tell you that, hey, it wasn't HE because it went <laughs> instead of boom. All right, so you can hear that's a different kind of round. So all these things, none of those are actually detectors yet. All right, but that's giving you standoff. That's giving you early warning. That's giving you situational awareness that something is different about the attack that's going on. So we actually still are continuing to invest in this area, but we're trying to use the technologies to integrate to that situational warning, situational awareness for a commander a little bit better. Um, so if you look at integrated early warning, that's where you find that embedded in there as a component of that uh, pillar of our program. Dr. Moore, did you have anything you wanted to add? So I would agree pretty much with everything Ron just said, but I would just kind of rehash that there's opportunities, I think, when we look at other technology areas, specifically some of the trends that we're seeing in biotechnology, perhaps, uh, trends that we're seeing in autonomy, um, as well as robotics, to actually achieve some of these same uh, objectives, but in totally new ways. And that's kind of where we're focused on. Okay, thank you. So moving on to the question about how are S&T efforts being prioritized and coordinated between DOD, academia, and industry? Take it. So I own that. That's part of my mission set. Um, so I actually have a 15-year 15, 15 S&T strategy. Um, I can't give that out to everybody. Obviously, a lot of people want to know what I'm investing in. Um, I can tell you in general that about 11% of the portfolio is invested towards uh, academia. So the basic research VA1 funding is about um, somewhere in the $40 million price range. Um, what we're really looking though for is to use s and to answer some of the questions that we have in the more advanced programs. You know, DARPA is the one that actually can go out and fail a lot. You kind of heard that earlier, that really our job is to translate technology into actionable, actionable items, material solutions for the warfighter. So really, really the balance is more towards industry and academia. About 50% of our funding goes towards the, the service laboratories and ensuring that we have that vibrant, resilient response capability that so that when we get surprised, I can immediately turn to the DOD laboratory to start helping us solve the problem. And every one of the, the last major instances that we had to respond to, we had to destroy Syrian chemical weapons, we had to respond to Ebola, you know, we had to go to the service laboratories first to get the initial movement going, and then we turned to our industry partners second um, to help us continue to, to do the battle because we can't do it all on our own. Uh, so it really is kind of that leveraging the balance between what does the service laboratory do, about 50% of our funding, and what does the industry do, about 40% of our funding, to help us get the capability needs that we want. So I often very much encourage our lab partners to work with industry to help bring those bigger solutions in to help us get the capability gaps that we have. Just quickly, um, Army Futures Command is a 
high end emphasis on this area, specifically working with academic and industrial partners. And so, at the last annual mission guidance update to the Future Force Modernization Enterprise, General Murray gave us specific guidance to say, we don't have a patent on all the good ideas in the world. So, leverage your partnerships to bring folks into the fold, and even more specifically, bringing folks out to some of the uh, exercises and demonstrations. So, historically, we've done that with possibly some service laboratory representation, but it's traditionally been, you know, your, your DITRA, your JPO folks. Um, but going forward, we're actually going to have folks going out to National Training Center. And the push is to actually have academic and industry partners coming out to those exercises with us. Okay. Anything else from the other panel members? So then uh, the uh, third question down, what should labs or organizations do as they build the future S&T workforce, uh, i.e. addressing the importance of aging skill sets, well-rounded interests in the process, changes to attract them? And if it could, I'd like to turn to Dr. Moore first to start with this, since uh, you played an integral role uh, as a center for that. So this is always a challenge. I mean, I'm going to highlight the facts that I'm always throwing out. Um, I probably said it here, but at least to certain audience members before. If you look across the nation right now, we have a, an aging workforce. If you look um, within the STEM professionals just in general, less than 4% of the nation's STEM workforce is 30 and under. If you look at folks getting graduate degrees, in science and engineering. Roughly in petroleum engineering, electrical engineering, 81% come from foreign nations, 79% in computer science, about another 57% uh, in chemical engineering. So if you look across the nation, it, it's critical that we invest at that pre-K through 12. Uh, we have programs at, at the center that, that do that. As part of that also, uh, the Combat Capabilities Development Command, formerly our ECOM, we have a campaign plan with the line of effort so line of effort tools, people in infrastructure. So we're putting a, a heightened focus on this, and all the senior leaders and directors within uh, CCDC are actually looking at our metrics to see uh, how we're doing in terms of recruiting. We're looking out beyond just your tier one um, research institutions as well. So we're going out to minority student institutions, HBCUs, some of the uh, middle tier universities, because this is probably where the workforce of the future is really going to come from. Um, so there's a heightened effort to do that. So we, again, it's leveraging everything from the SMART program. Um, at our center, we have programs like uh, College Qualified Leaders, some of the AEOP programs that the Army has, or the, uh, even in the joint community. So leveraging opportunities like that. Okay, thank you. Any other input from the panel? So moving to the next question at the strategic level, is there or are there working groups of medical and CBR and personnel that focus on CBR and not just medical countermeasures? And I think that uh, you can talk about lots of groups that have historically done this. The FEMC was a group that was not only at the DOD level but worked across uh, the interagency. It has been modified, I believe, uh, under the new uh, leadership, but the core tenets of coordinating, as uh, Dr. Barrera Orio had mentioned, uh, remain, which is deconflicting and as much as you can finding synergies in the research efforts. And that's not just a group of medical professionals, it brings in that operational focus of what are the requirements ultimately have to be either delivered to a first responder um, or a uh, warfighter organization, not just a medical organization. I like to say, um I know my, my staff are um, working group members for a joint staff, J8 led uh, CBRN working group that's uh, again working across uh, within DOD, different, different levels. Again, we're contributing uh, for with DITRA and, and, uh, and the JPO, again, different working groups. We're not, we're not leading any of those efforts, but again, we want to be uh, active uh, participants. But I do know our J8 is, is being a group on joint staff. I guess just to add a little more to that, this happens at all levels. I mean, the, the medical countermeasures are not in, in, in a box. I mean, they're threat-based. It, it starts, at least on the civilian side, with a medical threat determination done by a medical threat analysis at, uh, at DHS, who brings in all the partners, including DOD. So we try to have a common operating picture for where by which we define the requirements for the medical countermeasures. And then it breaks down into the more silo, more expertise-driven, threat space itself. But the point of this question, I, I believe, should be reiterated that everything has to be driven with the, the end in mind, 
and to make sure, as we can keep saying, capabilities, 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 we're not developing products for products. We're developing products to address the threat as defined by this coordinated effort across government with DOD and civilian hand in hand to find commonalities and common uh, solutions to these, these threats. Okay. Now, by my watch, we're right at 1,400. Um, I know there's one more question left on the board, but we'll go ahead and take that and close out this session. If you have other questions, I'm sure they'll be available unless you have the contact information. So it really comes back to where we started this morning with operational requirements or desired capabilities. How are those driving S&T programs and how well do we develop S&T for non-defined operational requirements? And so Dr. Hanna, I'll start with you and then let the other panel members if they have something to add, uh, supplement your comments. So I, I kind of as I mentioned before, there, there are specific gaps that the co combat and commands and the services want um, us to explore and get material solutions for specifically. Um, those go through the JCS process, they go to the JPO first, and that is where we do that first kind of look at, can we do it with technology that's already out there, commercial off the shelf and available? Um, if not, then it comes to the s and program, and, and part of our job is really kind of deconflict. What is it that you're trying to get at? So like we said, stand off earlier, you know, what is it that I'm really trying to achieve as a capability off that? So we'll spend some time in s and trying to better define the problem that the warfighter has and trying to understand the end state of where things would be. If it was right, what would it look like? And then what technologies would we need to get there to make it right? So, I mean, like, a, the services would love to have a tricorder that do all the stuff that you see in Star Trek, you know? Mm -hmm. But we know the technology doesn't get us there. So then we think about well, what are available technologies then that we can incrementally work our way towards the tricorder. Um, so that's kind of a one way we do it. You know, I also have a very strong um, interaction with the Army Seaburn School and, and the services in terms of um, concept development. So I go to, the, to these centers of where, where we have our, our warfighters and I say, here's what's on the technology horizon. If I give you this capability, uh, could you use that? Does that change the way you do business? So they'll go through the concept develop development process of seeing does it help them or not. And then we'll develop a prototype take a prototype out, have them take, do an, a user assessment. Let me, let me give you this tool, it has a certain kind of effect. You see some kind of use out of this. And then most power design that into a full technology demonstration um, that kind of further gets down the road. And it's usually by the time we're getting technology demonstrations, we're writing the CDEs, all those things that define a requirement that then create a program or record. So that's kind of that process of, you know, looking at the technology horizon, talking to the warfighter about what it could do, seeing if that actually spurs their interest, and if it does, then developing a prototype, demonstrating a prototype, bringing our, pro our, our acquisition partner, Joint Program Executive Office in very early in the process, so that they're seeing the iterations of these as we go through it, so at the end, we're kind of delivering a capability to the war party that they're actually asking for. Does that make sense? More? So, so kind of in line with what Ryan just highlighted, um, we also do similar activities and participate with the team, Severity at large. But in addition to that, we have something called the Severny Warrior Integration Program, we call it the CWIP program, where we partner very specifically with the 20 Severny. Um, we've got NCOs and as well as warrant officers that come into the laboratory and spend some time in the lab to understand what we do and how we do it. That helps in one regard. Uh, and additionally, we're sending some of our scientists out to work with the 20 Severny. We're going to get them out to the National Training Center. Uh, we do similar things with, with the Special Operations Community as well as uh, the CSTs and Thank you. Uh, from the other panel members, anything to add? I, I would just add that Special Operations Command is, is uh, leaning forward among all of the, uh, the COCOMs. They're, they're the one COCOM that's really leaning forward and trying to advance those very quickly. I was going to say that, you know, my office working with Health Affairs utilizes the JSITS process and uh, CBAs, but there's another question. Um, that's one of my challenges, is the that process. I mean, it, it's not the most uh, quickest process out there. One last point. So before we close out, I, I, what I want to say to the group here is, um, and some of you've heard me say this before, so I don't think it the wrong way, but I'm not really, I'm not really interested in the box that you got right now as commercial off the shelf. I really want to talk to your chief scientists about what you're working on for the next box. That's really what s and is all about. And for us, what we'd like to do is help you potentially with that one little change in, in a new device that gets us to a new capability we hadn't thought about before. So talking to your chief scientists talking to your people that are kind of the dreamers of, of where things are going. That's, 
really my target audience of who I like to talk to. So send me your chief scientists and send me your bright ideas and let us think about it and be conflicted and put me in contact with the war fighters and see if it actually makes a difference or not because we really could then influence, you know, does that become a, a future program that we want to do something with? So I, I just wanted to close with that. So thank you to the audience for your attention and your questions and I'd also like to thank our panel members for their comments today.